Hungry Trilobite Podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon. The longest-running pop culture convention in central Oklahoma is back. SoonerCon 30 will take place on June 24th through 26, 2022 in Norman, Oklahoma, starting with a membership drive in January. Visit SoonerCon.com for details. The Hellmouth Convention. The Hellmouth Convention is a celebration of all pop culture, but specifically things like Buffy, Angel, Firefly, and Dr. Horrible. It is held in Los Angeles, California, and the next event is scheduled for June 3rd through 5th, 2022. Proceeds benefit the Los Angeles LGBT Center as well as the Ron Glass Memorial Scholarship Fund. For more information, go to thehellmouth.org. On tap today, we have Frank Conniff, the star of MST3K, and currently the Mads are back. I am honored to have you here today, sir. Thank you for having me. Frank, I love following your Twitter feed and all your social media. What I really enjoy most is that you unabashedly consume a lot of movies and a lot of content, but you're very mindful about all of it. Even when you're watching the greatest classics or the silliest stuff, you always put a lot of thought into how you spin it. And I, as a person who loves movies a lot, I love that. Oh, well, thank you. You know, I just, uh, um, uh, I, you know, for me, Twitter, um, mainly it's a place that I like to write jokes on, you know, but um, uh, more and more, I, I just kind of like to jot down my, if I see a movie or, or something I like, I, I like to jot down my opinion or a recommendation. And um, those actually get bigger reactions than the jokes. <laughs> so... I don't know what that says about my jokes, but uh, but I, I enjoy doing it. Well, you're you're hitting something that you know a lot of people might not have seen some of these movies, or they might not have looked at them in that context. Uh, what I love about this is that it gives us a chance to start to look for maybe hidden treasures that we're starting to unearth in the days of streaming and you know cheap physical media. Right. Yeah, you know the the. Uh... The, the internet, uh, you know, I mean, I grew up um, in New York City and there were um, at least five full-time revival houses, movie theaters, um, the Bleecker Street Cinema, the New Yorker Theater, the Thalia Theater, um, uh, a couple of others, um, Carnegie Hall Cinema, um, where... Uh, like every day you could go and see old movies, you know, the, they were revival houses and, and unfortunately those theaters are all gone now, but um, everybody has that on their computer now, you know, um, you can either, you can stream stuff or you can watch Turner classic movies. And so, you know, that's, that's a, that's, that's, that's a great thing. And so um, it's good to be able to point people towards stuff. When I was growing up, I didn't grow up in New York City. I grew up in a small town, Pennsylvania. And my choices for finding old movies were either the local video store or PBS at 3 a.m. I didn't really have a third option. Yeah. So, so what we have today, it blows my mind. And, and the fact that we have revival projects and individual people can unearth classics that have been literally lost for generations. I, I think that's... I think movies are, we've had about a century of film and we have to find a way to, to bring out the gems. Yeah, it's, it's um, there's so much stuff and I think that it makes it uh, very challenging for um, creators now, you know, people who are making films or making their own video projects um, just to get attention. Uh, to what they're doing to get people to look at it. That's the challenge, you know. I, I'm amazed now by um, all the things um, uh, I've, I've, I'm not aware of. And, and when I was doing a podcast with Trace, Bill Yu, and Carolina Hildago, um, I remember Carolina suggested we do uh, what we do in the shadows uh, for an episode, and I had never heard of it. And these are all people that I should be following and should be so into their great comedy talents and a lot of people already knew about them but i didn't know about them so you know that, that to me that was just an example of that 
Yeah, that that is a really good point. I, I feel for filmmakers now trying to get their word out there because yeah. on one hand, we have more avenues than we ever had, but there's also more traffic than there's ever been. Right, yeah. I was just talking with an independent filmmaker yesterday who's got a really promising project. And I said, you know, back just 15 years ago, you could print up a couple thousand DVDs relatively cheaply and get it right to your, your target audience. That was that had its own problems, but now you've got the big studios crowding out Netflix and Amazon, and that's that's it's very hard to get your voice heard. Yeah, it is. You know, that's that's the challenge for sure. Have you seen that kind of thing pushing your own projects? Um, well, I you know as far as my uh, my own projects go, um, like for instance with. Uh, the monthly shows that the trace bill you and i do the mads are back um, which we were doing as a live show and now we do digitally um that's just a case of me being in the very fortunate position where there's a built-in audience for it already because of mystery science theater you know because of something like mystery science which has been established and which has a following and um so uh, when Trace and I started doing it, there were already people um, watching it. There were already people ready for it. And, you know, the audience we get for it compared to what a big media project gets is still very small, but it's, it's, it's enough for us. You know, it's enough to, to sustain us. And, um, and it's a great, it's very devoted following. So... So in that sense, um, uh, I'm lucky um, uh, that we have that going for us. You know, that, that when we started doing monthly digital shows, we weren't just people doing something that, you know, that wasn't associated with any kind of property the way we are, um, you know. So that's a very lucky thing. Uh, and also, you know, I, 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 I self-publish books and and i put them out there and um uh you know when we were performing live it was it was a really good thing to have for my merch table but i don't have that anymore uh right now at least but you know that was another case too where because i have a little bit of a following there is an audience for the books and it's not a huge audience but i do at least get the satisfaction of when i put stuff out there are people who always consume it, and and for the most part, from what I can tell, they enjoy it. So uh, I'm very lucky in that sense as well. Your writing, again, I love following your, your views on, on Twitter and the occasional blog you put out. It's a case of, I know you've seen so many movies. I know you've worked with so many different properties. I mean, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were, you're talking about the fact that you you unearth manos which is now a, a cultural phenomenon and that's the kind of thing that even if you never see the movie just knowing the story behind it knowing that this is this weird situation happened that's by itself is a great hollywood story and hollywood sometimes the stories about making the movies are more interesting than the movies themselves it's true you know i think someone was saying the other day that the you know there there have been every kind of Manos project now the a making of Manos movie would actually be pretty interesting if someone could mm -hmm. pull it off. I oh geez I'm drawing a blank on it. Um, there was a vampire movie in like 2002 or it was basically the story of the making of Nosferatu, but the uh, the no. twist was that. The, the vampire they had in the movie was real and they were the filmmakers were trying to hide it. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm the movie rings a bell. Yeah, I love the movie and, and I'm not a horror guy. So it's it, for me to grab onto it. I just think that would be a really great way to spin a making of Manos movie is to actually have some of the characters be real monsters and we didn't know it. Hey, man, go do it. <laughs> go make it. Challenge accepted. <laughs> um, but but seriously, I I also like the fact that sometimes you'll you'll flesh out the backstory for some of the actors and filmmakers because again the, the lives they led were so interesting, even stretching back to the silent era. 
Uh, yeah, you know, um, well, I always, you know, I enjoy, uh, in addition to, to watching movies, um, I really enjoy reading about movie history and about show business hist and cultural history in general. So I'm, if, if I like something, um, uh, I always like read up on it. You know, if I like a movie, I, I read up on the movie and find everything I can. Uh, usually after I watch a film, I, I go right to Wikipedia and, and see what kind of interesting stuff there is. And then, you know, that could lead me to buying a book about the movie or something like that. Is there a certain book that's been instrumental in, in pushing you toward this lifestyle? Um, well, I don't know if you'd call it a lifestyle. That's, I would. That's overstating the case. But uh, um, I don't know. You know, I've, I've read a lot of um, uh, um, books through my life. You know, I've written, I, I've read a lot of biographies of filmmakers um, you know, a lot of, um, there, there's certain film writers I enjoy, like David Thompson, I always read his stuff. And uh, for film criticism, I, I love Pauline Kael and Manny Farber. Um, uh, you know, so there, there's, um, uh, and you know, people write really good biographies like Patrick McGillian or, or Joseph McBride. Um, so, you know, it's hard to narrow it down. I've, I've just, uh, I, I've just, do I, I've, I've dove into so much of that stuff. Well, uh, I, I confess my bias here. I'm a guy who's read a fair amount of film books, but I know you've read 10 to 20 times more than I have. So any recommendations I can get, I'm, I always open my ears. Oh, okay, cool. I, I will say like, I've read the, the MST3K Colossal Guide back and forth dozens of times just like that that kind of commentary on the movies I, I stopped caring about the show per se and just wanted to hear about what it was like to have to watch these movies over and over and analyze them and it's now knowing that you're you're doing that just watching amc or T, uh, tcm i just i've always liked movies myself yeah yeah you know it's it's just uh, there's just so my uh, for a relatively new art form you know we're talking 150 years or something like that it's mm -hmm. um uh there's a lot out there to absorb and read and watch i mean even looking at the the earliest days when you know it was still just a, the experimental silent films the, the experimental part was huge because they went from just trying to capture a, a play on screen to making elaborate almost visual paintings within a couple of years yeah well when something is new you can't help but be experimental you know because mm -hmm. no, no one has done it before so whatever you just have to try stuff you know and that's how things get developed and and then they become the the commonplace i, I get a little frustrated when people put down youtubers and early streamers for for being you know, hacks or, or it's like, but nobody gave these people a, a plan or a map on how to do this. They're experimenting with something that that's new to us, just the way other art forms were new to the people that made them. Yeah. And, um, you know, and old media people, and I include myself in that category of people who grew up on old media and really don't, un didn't quite get what was happening when the internet came along. Um, just kind of left high and dry because, um, uh, you know, there are YouTube people who have YouTube channels and shows that I've never heard of. I couldn't even tell you any of their names, but they have much bigger followings than anyone, even on like uh, national TV. They get like a hundred million people like looking at their videos and stuff like that. And, you know, there are all these young kids and some of them have gotten sponsorship and are making a lot of money, but, but the, the uh, old school media ignores all of them. Like we, th oh, that's just, we think of that as, oh, that's just fringe YouTube stuff. Fringe, I mean, it's bigger than anything that, that, that you're doing on television, you know? It's, it's amazing that, that one of the things that the old media didn't get that we now do, or, or at least I think that people are getting is, you know, back, 
when we were younger, you find out about a new show and you want to recommend it. What's the first thing asked? Well, when's it on? What channel? And right. that's those two questions mean nothing these days. It's on when you want it to be. It's on your in your hand right there. Yeah, when I was a kid, um, yeah, there was. I mean, I'm I'm from the era when there was literally there was no VCR. There was no you couldn't tape anything, and there was very little that you could watch that didn't have commercials. You know, all of the movies that I grew up watching, I watched on a black and white TV with commercials. So. Um, you know, um, when, when, um, VHS came along and DVDs, I mean, I never even really cared about the extras on them. I just thought it was incredible that you could own a movie and watch it whenever you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And the ownership of it really became a huge thing. Like I said, I, I grew up in a small town. I didn't have, I, I very basic cable, usually not really anything I liked. So when I could say, well, you could get a catalog and order a lot of movies and, you know, have them on your shelf. This, this broke my brain. It's like, this is amazing. I know. Right. Yeah. So, and, and now with streaming stuff and, you know, you're what you're right. You can watch it whenever you want. You don't have to worry about being home. And uh, because if you didn't see it, you had to wait till like the summer to watch the rerun, you know, so mm -hmm. it's a whole, whole different world now. I worry a little bit about occasionally you'll see things leave a streaming service and people scramble to find a, a way to watch it. And I still think the physical media means a lot in, in ways that we're, we're, we're almost forgetting. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, uh, I, I've heard people uh, talk about that and, and they, you know, the people talk about classic movies is, is you know they they don't become available you know and i think that like i heard something about like when when disney bought 20th century fox they you know they stopped putting out their classic movies and stuff because they're not interested in them um and and so the most dependable way to have access to those movies is to actually own them on physical media so you're right mm -hmm. I, I, Disney is a, a particular offender there because, you know, they launched their Disney Plus and theoretically they market it as being everything Disney, everything Fox, but I can point to some things that are definitely not there, some conspicuous things. And I just feel like for as much of a piece of history as Disney and Fox are, that's stuff that we fans should be able to, to look at and enjoy uh, and I hesitate that I hope that they, they don't completely give up on releasing physical versions of this stuff, or at least periodically let, putting that stuff on their streaming service. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I, I watch Disney plus a lot, but uh, you know, you're right about that. Is um, I, I'm guessing that you're, are you really getting into things like uh, the Mandalorian or is it more of uh, the old yeah, classic I love, stuff? I love uh, the Mandalorian. I love, um, I love all of the Marvel shows that they put out the WandaVision and the, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and now um, Hawkeye and what if I've watched every episode of all of those things and, uh, and Loki and, um, uh so yeah i'm i'm you know i'm a very enthusiastic consumer of, of all that stuff burnout is not an issue for you uh not yet not yet it okay. could happen but not yet i i've heard a lot of fans who are, are longtime fans talk about that and i i've always just said hey if, if you're concerned about that take a break step away look at the other library of content out there because you, you can find something to, to take your mind off it and, and, and come back for a bit. I'm a, I'm a research nut, I guess, is what it boils down to. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. If I get burnt out on it, I'll just stop watching it for a while and then and then maybe I'll come back to it, you know. Mm -hmm. Is there, a, when you're looking at something like that, is there a certain studio that you think has a particularly interesting history or, or a particular legacy that you just really can't take your attention away from? Well, I mean, 
Uh, you know, the thing about Disney is it's it's not just one studio now. It's it's you know, it's it's Marvel and it's Pixar and it's um, Star Wars, you know, Lucasfilm. And, you know, they just very smartly just bought everything, you know, so. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I think it, as far as like classic movies go, um, movie studios all back in those days had their distinctive styles and you could actually tell what studio made a movie just by watching it, just by watching the decor or the visual. You can really tell when you're watching a Warner Brothers movie as opposed to an MGM movie. And um, uh, when it comes to um, uh, classic movie studios, you know, I mean, I'm a really, uh, uh, Warner Brothers, I think, was great, like in the, in the 30s and 40s. And um, I've, I, I've, I've, I've often compared um, uh, Kevin Feige, who, who makes Marvel films, to Hal Wallace, who was in charge of Warner Brothers, uh, uh, of production at Warner Brothers in the 40s, because it was the same kind of thing where it was a factory, but it was a factory that put out a really good product, you know? And um, so I, I love uh, Warner Brothers movies. I love uh, Paramount, all the comedies that Paramount made, um, you know, the uh, the Marx Brothers movies that they made and the, and, um, you know, Lubitsch and Preston Sturges. And um, so that, you know, they had their own distinctive style. And, um, uh, you know, and MGM, which was the biggest back then, that's kind of my least favorite of the, of the uh, classic movie studios. Although they did put out a lot of great stuff, like The, the Wizard of Oz, for instance. But, um, um, but back in those days, like you could actually have a preference for a movie studio, which I don't feel like I can't think of a case of that now, you know, but, you know, back then you could say I like Warner Brothers films. I like Paramount films. Um, I like RKO movies, you know, RKO and Universal. They did all the horror movies back then. So, you know, th that I feel is is. Um, is not the case anymore, which, you know, not necessarily is a bad thing because it, it all depends on the individual style of the filmmakers making the films. That's why I asked because, you know, now that we have so many giant and mega conglomerate companies, it's, it's easy to forget that there was a time each studio was distinctive. I mean, when I was growing up, I remember Universal was on a particularly high note between like the late 70s through the early 90s. And I, I came to find a preference for their movies. And now looking back, I really can't see that vibe from any particular company anymore. Um, yeah, and, you're right. It's 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 a because it's all conglomerates now, and it's never just one company. It's a lot of companies, and um, you know, and, and it's just a case of the filmmaker breaking through and making a good movie within whatever system they find themselves in talking about Disney and Marvel, everybody's still kind of reeling from that purchase, which is now almost 10 years ago. And I just keep thinking this is not that different than Warner Brothers acquiring DC Comics late 60s, early 70s. And now we just take for granted that every Batman and Superman movie is a Warner Brothers property. And I think 20 years from now, it'll be the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, in, in the case of of DC and Marvel, you know, <clears throat> their films do have a totally different distinctive style from each other, you know, so that that <clears throat> that's the case where you, a modern case where you can tell the difference between something Disney made and something Warner Brothers made, at least in terms of superhero movies, because um, uh, they have a whole different approach. I'm one of those people that I, I just like to imagine if we had the same mindset back then, what it would have been like to take the, the Robert Lowry Batman and team him up with the Kirk Allen Superman, just get, get a 1940s version of the Justice League together <laughs> because I'm just a giant dork. What can I say? That would, that would have been cool. I have to admit. Yeah. And 
obviously that's something that would have been just foreign to that audience at the time, but just feel like there, there was something there. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the difference, one of the main differences between um, previous era of Hollywood movies and now is that, um, you know, the B movies are the A movies now and the A movies are the B movies, you know? So in other words, a property like Batman or Superman in the 1940s uh, was relegated to the shorts, you know, to the serials um, or to B movies um, or in the K or, you know, or cartoons, which, uh, you know, the Max Fleischer Supermans are some of the best versions of that ever done. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and the same thing in the in the 50s and 60s horror movies sci-fi movies were b movies they were on the bot they were for drive-in theaters they they came out on the bottom half of the bill with a few exceptions a few notable exceptions um but uh, now those movies that used to be looked at as just filler just b movie filler that's those are the movies that have 200 million dollar budgets now that are the main the main purpose of every studio is to make those movies. It's they're their total A movies now. So that's like a complete reversal of what things used to be like. And that's that's a really good way to put it. I've never thought of it that way, but you're a hundred percent right. And I, I guess I, I just want to ask if if we had this this whole era where the movies that we look at were just considered throwaway for you know kids or teenagers making out in cars or they they were just meant to fill a screen for a weekend to get the quick buck and now that's that's what we go to i mean what does that say about the stuff we're making now what does that say about our priorities as an audience well i mean i think there's a there's a long history in america of of things when they were made being thought of as disposable um and thought of as uh being pulp or um, uh, something that's not taken seriously. And then um, the test of time shows, no, wait, that stuff is great. People, it, it, it lived and people are still, still into it. You know, I, I think um, uh, most, most of the great American art forms, um, whether it's, uh, whether it's jazz or rock and roll or, or animation or comic books, um, or even just movies themselves or Westerns or, um, you know, film noir, um, all of those things. My point is, is that all of the great American art forms start off as disreputable art forms. Not, in other words, you know, America is very specific in terms of, uh, in terms of the critical establishment from a long time ago, um, where Europe, you know, European was what was respected, classical music, and uh, you know, and American art forms were were just, <clears throat> you know, like vaudeville, or it, it just was not considered art, you know. And I think it's when, when something starts out, like you were talking about YouTube videos before too, when something starts out not, that isn't considered art, that's usually a good sign that it's gonna become art, you know? Or, or, or pop music is a good example of that where top 40 stuff from the 60s uh, and the 70s, like it's just considered disposable pop music you know, commercial pap. And then like, here we are 60 years later, people are still listening to it, you know, um, it, it completely standing the test of time. So, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think um, we, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't go to the act to the critical experts to tell us what is the stuff of value because, um, you know, the stuff of value proves itself over time. Um, it's not something that can be determined by, uh, you know, higher ups who, who, who pass judgment on everything. Yeah, I just to think about your referencing European art and I, when America was formed as a nation, 
it actually took a fair amount of time before an, an author who was lived in America could actually be as, as respected as a, you know, the idea was that European books and, and, and English books were the ones that were worth reading and people making stuff here, they were making garbage. They were making disposable stuff right. for it. For, and, and it was almost a century before that was, you consistently had American authors that had respect. Yeah, very true, very true. I'm, I'm, I'm again, to go back to comic books, a lot of the stuff from the, the 40s to the 60s, when it was at its most disposable stage, you look at that artwork and you're seeing stuff that people would frame and put on the wall today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how, who would have thought that the 10 cents they spent, whoever spent on Action Comics number one, that would be worth million, literally millions of dollars one day. Mm -hmm. and that's, a good, that's a good investment. Yeah, it definitely is. You know, I, I've always kind of had the fantasy of if I had a time machine, what would I grab? And that's, you know, hitting a newsstand around 1938 would definitely be on my list. Yeah, you'd come back and you'd make a fortune. Yeah, I make a couple stops in the 80s for the, some action figures, too. Okay. Yeah. Any stuff from my shelf while I'm at it. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I hate to keep you too long because I know you're a busy guy, but I guess my last question should be, what would you grab if you get that time machine? Oh, well, <clears throat> well, you know, if, if all I wanted to do was, uh, was, um, uh, was make money, I, uh, action comics number one would be the obvious choice, um, uh, to grab. Otherwise I, you know, just for, as a cultural artifact, um uh i i guess i would i would just go into like a 1938 bookstore and and just browse and and see what looked interesting uh there's probably be some first editions of stuff too that i could bring back and make money with but um uh i think if i could go back in time like i, I wouldn't be as interested in grabbing stuff like that i would be more interested in just walking around and you know I think it'd be fascinating to walk around in New York in the 1940s and just absorb what it was like to be there, you know, and stuff like that, I think would be more interesting to me. I mean, you look at the the differences in the pacing, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And just, you know, all the, the way when you look at old clips of stuff and how interesting everything looks from today's perspective, all of the design and everything, um, looks really interesting all of the signs you know um you know that that would be that would be fascinating it, it would be um i would definitely be a time traveling tourist if i had the option just to to soak things up and and just see what if people really did act or or absorb the world differently than they do now yeah although i'm sure i'd be the one to step on a butterfly and ruin everything yeah, and, and if you grab that Action Comics number one, you may stop the next person from getting it, and they may not write the next great American novel. You, you may have stopped Mitch Turner's tracks. Yeah, you never know. So it's probably best to uh, get the uh, graphic novel reprint now and just be happy with that. Yeah. Frank, I want to make sure that people can follow your adventures. I highly recommend checking out your Twitter. Uh, check out The Mads Are Back. Where else can people follow your adventures online? Yeah, pretty much just Twitter uh, and Instagram. I think I'm F Conniff on Instagram and Frank Conniff on Twitter. Um, those are the last of the uh, of the social media platforms that I haven't been banned from yet. So uh, you can check me out there. Awesome. Well, Frank, thanks so much for doing this. I'm going to put everything we talked about in the show notes on my website, and I hope to have you back on real soon. Uh, thanks for having me. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Likewise. Okay. Take care. You too.